we're continually met with a tokenistic approach to climate action and sustainability. And we have three really poignant examples of that here. For one, we know very well the rise of greenwashing. Companies use an arsenal of techniques to appear sustainable. In fact, more companies are interested in being seen to do the right thing than they are on, in just getting on with it and doing it. Many companies spend more on their marketing budgets for sustainability than they do actually investing in true sustainable solutions. We see this and lots of different methods along with it. Vagueness, overinflated phrases, selective disclosure. A really simple example of selective disclosure is the silver bullet solution that is electric vehicles, right? What companies often don't want to tell us is how extractive the practices are to produce the batteries that go into electric vehicles, how polluting they are. It's much easier to say, hey, let's just swap out a gas-guzzling car engine with an electric vehicle than actually re-engineering our cities to be more pedestrian, to be more livable, to have less air pollution, because the electric vehicle option is far more profitable. And of course, we see lack of proof and meaningless labels. There's no regulation around words like eco, sustainable, climate-friendly, nature-based. So companies use these words at will to convince us that they're the solution. And I've sat in hundreds of boardrooms. I've sat across from thousands of business leaders. And I can tell you that the vast majority think of sustainable products as an opportunity to add on a price premium, to charge more for doing less, for attracting a new consumer base. Oftentimes, when we bring young people into rooms with business leaders, they don't ask us, how can we be the solution? They ask, but what did Gen Z care about? Because that's the information they'll use in their next marketing campaign. We see another version of this in woke washing. Lots of companies capitalize on social movements to, again, uh, appear relevant and trendy to this generation. You see on Global Pride Day, lots of companies turning their logos into rainbow flags. You see companies coming out on LinkedIn with really inspiring posts about Black Lives Matter and gender equity. But those same companies, oftentimes, may very well be producing products in places like Bangladesh, which are dependent on young women to make depend on young women dropping out of their education so they can be paid slave wages to support their families. The disconnect between what we're talking about and action, real solutions, is ever-growing. This was a kind of funny example from Marks and Spencer's, which was the LGBT sandwich. But they're not all funny examples. Some of them are really, really insidious. And in many ways, it's more dangerous to spend time being seen to do the right thing, because then it's a lot easier to convince ourselves that we're part of the solution as well. If we buy a product that's a little bit more eco or a little bit more expensive, then perhaps we can feel like we're doing the right thing, rather than examining our lives and our choices in a much more critical way. And finally, there is a new term on the block, which is youth washing. And this is when brands publicly affiliate with young people, and particularly young activists, without inviting us into the decision-making process. Dominika from Poland put this really eloquently in the wake of COP26 last year. She said, young people are being invited to panels, being invited to give speeches, being applauded and praised, but that applause we gain means nothing if there isn't any action behind it. Increasingly, we're being handed the microphone but we're consistently and systematically being excluded from the decisions that are governing our future. Now we see how these feelings among Gen Z are manifesting and changing attitudes. There was a recent survey from Deloitte uh, in over 45 countries, which showed that one in two 18 to 25 year olds are choosing their preferred employers based on personal ethics, 
with climate change the number one concern above unemployment. So young people are choosing to go unemployed rather than working for companies that are not aligned with their values. And interestingly, a talk for another time, this is actually manifesting as a much more immediate risk for a lot of the companies we work with. Climate change might be an existential threat to them and long term, and you know they're able to kind of put it off. Um, but the fact that young people don't want to work for them anymore is truly terrifying. But we see this also manifesting across generations. It's not just Gen Z. 93% of employees say that acting on climate is important to their personal sense of motivation and well-being. What that means is it's not just important whether you recycle at home and you change energy suppliers. It's important what you actually do for your nine to five, how you create influence in the world. But the statistic that makes me feel really sad <laughs> and makes me feel pretty despairing is the fact that while 70% of young people are eco-anxious, just 26% of young people feel that they can meaningfully make a difference. So levels of care are at record highs, and yet many of us feel that we still don't have the skills, the tools to actually create change in the world. And that is why more than ever, we need a revolution in mindset. I used to think that maybe the problem was that people didn't care enough. And yet, having talked to folks from every corner, from every age demographic, from every country, I know the problem isn't that people don't care, but that we're not empowered to. And so we need to empower people to take action. Mindset, in my belief, is the most powerful, underutilized tool that we have to solve the climate crisis. And here we show Force of Nature's theory of change for doing just that, for mobilizing mindsets 